Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. If able, please stand as we read from God's word. That's 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 16. And in your pew Bible, that's page 1188. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the the world, taken up in glory. Thank you, Drew. You may be seated. Isn't it wonderful that we have the opportunity as a church Uh, I don't know if you realized that last week we've been talking about the church and how God has ordered it with elders and deacons and the family of God. And last week we had elders teaching, like this morning, like Drew, we had deacons reading scripture. And as we met together as a congregation last week, we had the engagement of the body of Christ seeking to determine and follow God's way and will for this local body. It's good to be a part of a church that is seeking to follow God's word and scripture and and work in that way. May we always continue to do that and seek that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for the goodness of who you are. We thank you that you have done everything necessary for us to have relationship with you. We thank you that before the foundations of the world you have called for yourself a people. We thank you that we can come directly to you as Father because of what Christ has done for us, taking our sin on himself, satisfying our sin debt, propitiating, making propitiation to you that your wrath, your just righteous wrath would not be poured out on those who are yours. Lord, we thank you this morning that we can have hope and life in your name as we heard read earlier at the beginning of the service. Lord, we confess to you that we fail you, that we fall short of the mark, that we sin, that there is sin in our lives which is unpleasing to you. This morning, Lord, we confess that to you. We pray that your spirit would reveal in our hearts anything in our deeds, in our thoughts, in our actions that is unpleasing to you. And that both what we are aware of and what you will make us aware of, that we will confess those things to you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us of unrighteousness. We pray that we would stand before you as a people who are pure in your sight. We thank you that in Christ we are justified, but we seek to be conformed to your image more and more every day. So Spirit, do your work of burning away the dross of our sin natures, the the dross of our sinful, selfish desires that entice us and lead us astray. Continue to be faithful to yourself, Lord. And our response is going to be to give you praise and glory, to seek to worship you and to glorify you in worship and discipleship as we follow you and in mission as we take the good news of the gospel to others. Lord, may that always be the heartbeat of your church as we exist here in this body as First Baptist Bettendorf. Lord, wherever we may turn aside or go astray, bring us back. Give us strong leadership. Give us strong brotherhood that we would look after one another and realize that the church is not for what we get out of it, but for what we give to you and as we care for one another. Lord, be glorified in your people this morning. 
Be glorified in the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. Be lifted up that you would draw us to yourself again today. And for some of us, maybe for the first time. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So we have been going through, uh, as you, if you've been traveling along with us, we've been walking through Paul's first letter to Timothy. He wrote to Timothy, who was at Ephesus, and he spent time as he began his letter sort of relaying the issues that Timothy would be facing, was facing, the things that had already been dealt with in some ways as Paul had been in Ephesus before, and that, to no surprise, even early on in the church, was the issue of false teaching. People who heard the gospel and yet uh, turned away from it, taught something different, either out of a desire for selfish personal gain or just a a disagreement with the truth, a desire to be seen as wise, as teachers of the law, so perhaps being Judaizers, leading, attempting to lead people just like in Galatia, people back to following the law, which is not the gospel or people who were coming up with different ideas about how this all shook out, maybe denying the actual physical body, bodily resurrection of the Lord, claiming some kind of special knowledge. But in any event, Paul is writing to Timothy because he knows that Timothy is going to face these things, and so he spent time so far in his letter giving this challenge, outlining the, challenge, outlining the challenges that are faced, encouraging Timothy to fight the good fight of faith, He has given instruction on how the church should be ordered, how there should be elders and deacons, how there should be uh, male rule just as there is within the home according to the order God created, how things should work in the house of God. And then what we're going to look at at today then uh, is a a change in direction a little bit, a, a transferring into, okay, Timothy, I've told you about the household of God and how it's to be ordered, how it should work, how it should be led. Now we're going to talk about the why, because of the world that we live in and the challenges that we will face from our culture, Timothy, and from even these who are challenging the gospel within uh, the house of God itself. So threats both from without and within. And of course, he comes to this sort of high point, uh, key passage in his letter where he describes the church as the household of God. And that's what we've been uh, sort of titling this message series. How do we live living as God's household? How do we fight the good fight of faith from a pure conscience and in love? How do we conduct ourselves, as he'll talk about in verse 15, as the household? Now, as we said, last, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the order of that. We've talked about elders. Last week, Pastor Corey talked about uh, deacons and what that looks like, serving. And of course, uh, it goes beyond those into the entire household. Uh, last week, Pastor Corey did a great job of, of giving us that picture of what a household looked like in this time and culture that, that Paul is writing, that there would be a, a, a owner, a, a, the person who was the head of the household, and under him he would have a steward who would make sure that his wishes were carried out. And we see that in this, in this analogy that Paul gives as the, as the elders of the church. They're responsible for carrying out the wishes and the will of the master of the household. And then there would be servants, those who served within the household. And we talked about last week how those are, that's the calling of deacons, that office of deacon where, uh, where they are given the role of carrying out uh, the things that are necessary for everyday life within the household. Today, building off of that, we come to the rest of the household. And that church is us. It's all of us. Now, in the last two weeks, you've heard that even though there's these qualifications for elders and qualifications for deacons, that uh, at the very least, the qualifications for all of us as followers of Jesus, as members of the household, are no less. Those qualifications are, are really the baseline for even elders and deacons, those who lead, uh, but they should be an exemplary, 
example, that's redundant, an example of what that is that people can follow. In other words, Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. And we could follow Paul and, and be sure that he's leading us in the right direction. That should be the role of elders and deacons. But no less are these things that have been outlined over the last couple of weeks and within this chapter, chapter three, uh, no less are they the qualifications of a follower of Christ, a member of the household the family of God. Now on that note, and I'm gonna be intentional about this, I'm I'm gonna tell you this is parenthetical, and this is stepping on toes maybe, and this is getting to meddling, this is not part of the, the message that we're gonna unpack here in a moment, but folks, we are a family. And families naturally, if they're healthy, grow, don't they? You know, you have a couple of generations And then it grows, and every once in a while, if you're part of one of these families, every once in a while, you get together at some park somewhere and have a nice meal together, and you get to see all the members you haven't seen for a while. And you gather together as family, and there's extended family. And then you have your family at home, and we church, we First Baptist are a family. And we're a family that God is growing Do you realize how many people, I I, I don't remember the exact number, but I had to do a report on it at the end of the year for the SBC. Uh, We had upwards of 10, 12, somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 or 15 people join our fellowship last year alone, and we've had more since the beginning of this year. We're growing. And if we're a family and if we're to care for one another, we need to know each other. And I know some of us think, well, yeah, uh, let's get a directory together so we can know each other. I'm just going to tell you, families don't have directories. Families gather together, and they meet together, and they talk together. And so if you're here this morning, you look around, and you see faces you don't know, man, you have great opportunities to get to know the new members of our family. You can join a discipleship group. That's our bread and butter, where we do discipleship where we learn and grow together, you will build new relationships as the family if you join a discipleship group. Or maybe it's just taking advantage of all these fellowship meals we have. Come to one of those meals and as you sit down over a bowl of kidney beans, make sure that you get to know some folks. Learn their names, learn their faces. Walls can be good, directories can be good, but people, let's just talk to each other and get to know each other. And be built together as the household of God. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming in 1 Timothy 3. We are the household of God. And Paul has been writing intentionally in this way and with this analogy. So that Timothy and the church at Ephesus and by extension the church of Jesus Christ all times all places. Will know our challenges. Will know who we are. Will know what we're about and what we are to do, how we are to conduct ourselves as the household of God, not just in it. So let's look to this word again. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul begins in verse 14 by giving his purpose. What is Paul's purpose in writing this letter to Timothy? He says this, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. So there's a couple things here that I want to just pull out for us as we look at this. Paul gives his purpose here. Timothy, uh, I'm writing this letter because I, I actually long to be with you, but I'm delayed. Now, we, we believe that Paul wrote this letter from Macedonia. He had intended to come to Ephesus. He's been delayed in Macedonia. And so he sends this letter because he himself cannot be there. And so the next best thing to Paul being there is Paul writing a letter. In other words, when Timothy is encountering these challenges, whether it's by people like Hymenaeus and Alexander who have been uh, disfellowshipped, or whether it's new uh, false teachers or Judaizers rising up in the church, how is Timothy supposed to instruct them and and have the authority to do so? Paul has written in here, well, first of all, the authority is Christ. He's the head of the church. That is the sole, supreme, and only authority. 
But Timothy, you will have elders who are under shepherds who will carry out his wishes, and there will be deacons who will serve, and the household as a whole will be looking to those leaders to guide them in truth. And Timothy, if for some reason someone contradicts you, if for some reason someone rises up against what you've been teaching, what I've taught you, what the gospel of Jesus Christ is, you have this letter. Show them the letter. Here's Paul's words. Here's the authority. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Paul. And Paul would say, don't take my word for it. Listen to Christ. And so he says, I desire to come, but if not, if I'm delayed, use these words as a way to contradict the false teachers that it, it carries the weight of my presence in my absence. More specifically, Timothy, I'm writing to you so that you know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, or I think we could say as the household of God. And there's two ways to look at this. First, Timothy, you are a leader. You are serving in that capacity within the, within the household. You bear the responsibility in my absence of making sure that sound doctrine is held to, that the ways in which you live are exemplary, that both the culture around you and the people within the church can look to you and see an example of what it looks like to live as a member of God's household, who lives by the words and the ways of Christ, who carries out the will of the Father. But it's not just you, Timothy. Notice he doesn't say, I'm writing to you, Timothy, so that you know how you should behave in the household, conduct yourself. No, I'm writing to you, Timothy, so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself. In other words, all of us are those ones we're the ones, we're the himselves and herselves, we're the, the household. It would do no good for the household to have exemplary leadership and the members of the family to bring dishonor. And so he's laid out for Timothy so far what that conduct should look like. Let's review. Timothy, I want men everywhere in every place to lift up holy hands and pray for those in authority Holy hands meaning lives unstained by sin. Sin is the exception, not the rule in their lives. Their hands lifted is not a physical posture. It's a posture of their heart. Their hands representing what they do, how they live everyday life. That the things they do, the ways they live would be exemplary and would reflect the holiness of God and how they beseech him. Timothy, I want women to adorn themselves not with all the, the greatest, newest fashions, not in ways that draw attention to themselves, but adorn themselves with godliness, which here again is simply Christian ethic, Christian living, the life of Christ through the individual, that godliness would be exuded from the women so that when people look at them, they don't take notice of them, but of their Savior. Adorn yourselves with godliness and the works of your hands representing the good godly deeds of a believer of someone whose life has been changed. Timothy, I do want for you and other leaders to make sure that you're fulfilling your role as under shepherds, as stewards, as overseers, as elders. Make sure you're carrying out the will of the master of the household. Make sure you're defending against aberrant teaching. Make sure that you're being clear about what the truth of the gospel is, Timothy. Lead others to follow as well. Guard and lead the sheep in the truth that they would not be led astray. Timothy. Deacons as well as you serve, as you bring order and help bring order to the household and keep unity in the body where because we're people there's going to be natural friction and rubbing against each other. Deacons, make sure that the household of God runs smoothly and well-oiled so that as the world around the church observes them, they do like what happened at the beginning of the book of Acts. They see your love for one another they're changed by it. They're intrigued by it. And God will add to the number daily those who are being saved. There's an order here, Timothy. There's a way that we should live, a way we should conduct ourselves as the household of God. And it's not just elders and it's not just deacons. It's the family. 
may we conduct ourselves well. When I was growing up, my granddad uh, was pretty conservative to the point that he, uh, he was one of these, and there, nothing wrong with this, so I'm not downing this, nor am I upholding it, I'm just telling it. He was one of these that rightly, in many cases, observed television, and I'm talking about television in the 50s and 60s, not what we have today even, and said, you know what, that's not something I want in my house. There's a lot of ungodliness that's celebrated there, and so for our family, we will not have a television. Well, my dad happened to grow up in that house. And so as a little kid, you can't imagine what it was like going to school on Monday and everybody talking about the Smurfs or what happened on one of the other cartoons and you just had to nod your head and act like you knew what they were talking about. And as my dad continued to grow and we were his family, we did eventually get a television. Didn't change. I went to school and as the kids were talking about Smurfs and Snorks or whatever it was, uh, I was wanting to share about how I had just watched on Saturday morning one of those good Roy Rogers and Del Evans westerns. Because that's what mom watched and that's what I watched. But my parents were trying to guard us, even as they themselves were experiencing a little bit more freedom in that gray area. But something unquestionable happened whenever granddad came to visit. When Granddad came to visit, the television went away. Was my dad being secretive? No. They were aware that we had a television. But my dad desired to honor his father. And so when dad was around, he modified behavior to honor his dad, even though it was his house. Now this is an imperfect analogy as all of them are, but I'll just remind us, God is always around. He's always here. And our heart must be to honor him in what we do. So even if there's a gray area where we have freedom, like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, or if we choose to our own dishonor to reject godliness in our own homes, in our own secret lives, just remember that How we live as the household of God shows how we honor God, the master of the house. How we live in our house and our life, not just here on Sunday as we assemble as his household as the church, reflects how we honor God. And there is a world watching church. And there are people who know that you assemble with this body. And they will watch your life And what they determine about you, and even more importantly, what they determine about our Father, will be reflected in what they see in your life. This is not a guilt trip. I have plenty of warts in my life. But may we live in such a way, conduct ourselves in the household and in the culture around us in such a way that we bring honor to the name of Christ and to the household of God. Timothy, I'm writing you so that if I can't make it there, you and the household know how we should conduct ourselves. That's his purpose. Well, then what is our purpose in response to that? What's the response and the purpose of the church at Ephesus that Paul is writing to? What's our purpose as members of the household? Verse 15, the second half of this. Writing that you will know how to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And there it is. Why do we conduct ourselves this way? Is it so we can say I'm better than everyone else? Is it so we can point a finger at the world around us? No. It's because we've been given a trust We've been entrusted with guarding the gospel, the truth of God's word, the truth of who he is. We are the church of the living God, Paul says. Paul writes in Romans that 
It's a favorite verse for many, often lifted out of context. But all things work together for the good of those who love God. People usually stop there in verse 28 of Romans 8. Well, it's all going to work out. God's working it all together for my good. Finish the verse. For those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God does love us, but he possesses us. He created us, and as a result of the fall, we broke fellowship with him. We, like the young foolish boy, took our inheritance and ran off and squandered it. But the father was always watching, always waiting, and at the right time, at the fullness of time, he sent Jesus to buy us back to redeem us, to purchase us again. So we have been twice possessed by God, the living God, and we have been called for his purposes, not our own. If we will live by our own purposes, we will die in our sin. We've been brought into the household and called for his purpose. He is the living God. In contrast to these gods that the people in Ephesus were aware of, In contrast to false gods, there in Ephesus there was a great temple to Diana or Artemis, depending on which gender you want to go with, a Roman god who was not a god at all, a made-up fabrication of the minds of men, just like Paul writing in Romans 1 instructed or told us about those exchanges, how men exchanged the truth and the glory of God for idols made with human hands. False gods. You see, we serve the living God who created us from the dirt of the ground and from, who knit us together in our mother's wombs, who gave us life and being. That's the living God. The false gods are the ones that we foolish people shape and form ourselves with our finite hands. Church, we are members of the household of the living God the one true living God, and he is not dead as some have claimed, and he is not uninvolved as some have claimed, and he does exist, and he's reigning today. He is the living God. He's not a dead God. For those in Ephesus, they would be well aware of emperor worship. Caesar is Lord would be the phrase of the day, but Caesar died, all of them. And every false teacher who connects for themselves a following dies. There's one living God, Jesus Christ, who came in flesh, who died on the cross, but who rose again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Church, we are the church. We are the household possessed by the master of the living God. And don't ever forget it. Don't shy away. Don't be shy or bashful. Don't be a jerk. But be confident that the God we serve, who is our Father, is alive and well. And even when we see chaos all around us, that we remember that He is the God of order, that He has not abdicated His throne, that He is in full control of everything that we see and cannot see. And yes, He works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. He is working his perfect good will out in this world. Church, we are the church of the living God, and as such, our purpose is to act accordingly. How do we act accordingly? We are the pillar and support of the truth, the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Some years ago, when I was in college, we had an opportunity to travel uh, with our university, and we went to France, and we were able to go to uh, Notre Dame. Maybe you have seen pictures or have been there yourself, and you see this great structure, and it has these, these curved support pieces coming up on the sides. Uh, those are buttresses. They help hold and give strength to the walls. Now, we know what happened a few years ago when that fire started in that church, And the roof collapsed and the the building fell to ruin. In the same way, church, if we are not standing on the foundation of the truth, 
If we are not carrying out our role as the pillars and the buttresses of truth, the same thing can happen to this church or any church. Now, don't be confused. The truth of the gospel does not depend on us. Should we be apostate and walk away like many churches have done in our culture, turn our backs on the truth, be swayed by the the blowing, prevailing winds of culture, ignore, change, vote out the truth of God, and this church falls apart and becomes a shell of what it was created to be, the truth of the gospel goes on. In not one way is it weakened. But as long as we are the household of God, as long as we stand on the foundation as pillars, and again, Timothy and those in Ephesus would have maybe brought to mind that temple to Diana or Artemis, surrounded by over a hundred pillars wrapped in bronze and gold and precious things, holding up the roof of that temple, which today stands in ruin. We are the pillar of of the, of the truth. We stand on the foundation which is Christ and we have been built together as his temple. Paul in Ephesians 2 and, for, and Peter in 1 Peter 2 both tell us that we are living stones, that we've been brought together and built into the household of God. In Ephesians, uh, uh, who he's writing to Through Timothy here, he uses that household phrasing again and reminds the church that Christ is the cornerstone. He's the foundation. Our job then is to be the the, the pillar, the support that holds it up, that upholds the truth. We then are proof of the truth. The way we conduct ourselves when we are changed by the gospel will support the truth. When we live our lives in the culture around us and in the church and our lives support and are are stabilized by standing on the truth of the gospel and people see change in our lives, not perfection but continuing change, where we are being conformed to the image of Christ, that gives proof and validity to the message of the gospel. And so we support it through how we live these changed lives, being conformed to the image of Christ being justified as called and one day glorified. Not only in how we live, but we are called to be guardians of the truth. This is the the message again of this letter, to guard the deposit, guard the gospel, guard the truth, and uphold it. How do we do that practically? As I was working through this, I tried to think through what are the ways that we uphold the truth? What does it look like to live the gospel? And I developed a list, and as I was studying, I found that, you know what, there's lots of people that have done this, so I figured that's probably a pretty good thing to go ahead and share. So with a little help of kind of organizing my thoughts from John MacArthur, and there's others out there, this is the list that I wanted to develop to us to kind of think about how do we uphold the truth? How do we live the gospel? First, we hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17, Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing uh, the word of God. So church, household, family, if we are going to uphold the truth of the gospel, we need to be assembling ourselves and hearing the gospel, hearing it preached, hearing it taught in discipleship settings. Hearing it ourselves on a daily basis, hearing it at home as dad leads the family in worship as a family. We need to be hearers of the word of God. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit uses it to cut down in between bone and marrow to the deepest parts of who we are and shape us and convict us and encourage us and strengthen us. So we should be hearers of the word if we're going to conduct ourselves as the household. We should read it. The only thing I can say here is that Jesus said, you you know, it's written. So apparently he read it. We know he did, and so did everyone else. Now in those days, only a few were able to study it. Only a few were able maybe even to read. There were definitely those who were illiterate. 
And throughout the annals of history, there are times where the common person in the pew, the family of God, the household, did not have access to the word. And through God, through his providence, and through the, the, the testimony and life, even life-giving work of many throughout history, we today sit in a country where you can get any number of versions of the word of God in a way that you can understand it. There are also some out there that you should not be reading. The message is a waste of time, and the Passion Translation is pagan. That's just my brief summation of those two. If you want to read the message for personal whatever, that's fine, but it's not a translation. Find a good translation of scripture. People have given blood, sweat, and tears to put it into our language. We can buy any number of them through Amazon or any other way you want to. Maybe for some of us, it just means walking into a room and dusting it off. Read your Bibles. It will not return void. How can we uphold the truth if we don't even know it? So let's hear it. Let's read it. Let's think on it. There's something our culture is increasingly encouraging us not to do. Don't spend any time thinking deeply or critically. Veg out, man. Hit the Netflix and binge a whole series, all 17 seasons. You earn it. You've been working hard all week. Just unplug. Don't think. You know, when you lack thinking skills, that's how you can be swayed so easily. When you don't know the truth, you can believe any lie. The psalmist wrote, that the righteous man planted by a tree, planted like a tree by the rivers of water, grows, and one of the things he does is he delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. He thinks about the word of God constantly. And as he thinks deeply about it, and wrestles with it, and struggles to understand it, we have the promise of Jesus himself that the Holy Spirit will guide us in truth. He'll reveal to us the truth when we think through it, when we meditate on it. That is the process of hiding it in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Hear it, read it, meditate or think on it, study it. In his next letter to Timothy, Paul writes, Timothy, study to show yourself approved. A workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, but who rightly divides the word of truth. And yes, he's writing to Timothy as a leader and as a teacher, but what have we already said about all his qualifications for elders and deacons? They're baseline. They're for all of us. Study God's word. And if you don't like it, pray until you do. And if you don't Crave it, read it, and study it until you do. And the Holy Spirit will do a work in you. He will bring life through his life-giving word because he's a living God whose word does not return void. Study the word of God. Then live it. James 1.22, don't just be hearers of the word, but doers, obey it. Live out what you learn and what you study and what you meditate on and what you hide in your heart. Live by it. Constantly remove yourself from the throne of your life and place Jesus in his rightful spot. And live as the household under the fathership of the master through the power of the Spirit, by faith in the name of the Son. And then defend it. This is the part where we aren't jerks. Defend it doesn't mean go on the offensive and go around and be offensive by telling everybody what they're doing wrong and how you have it all right. Instead, it's humbly being ready, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Be ready to offer a defense for the hope that you have within you. See, when you're living as the household of God, people will notice. 
And God will use your example to draw people to himself. And they're going to come. Some will come to antagonize you. Some will come because they're curious. But in either event, be ready to explain to them, to give an account for, the word actually says, the hope that you have in you. Hey, I live this way and I have this joy because I serve the living God. Who though I turned my back on him and rebelled against him while I was still a sinner, sent Jesus Christ to make payment for me and to possess me for his own and I have an inheritance. I'm in the house, folks. I'm a child and you can be too. Be ready to give a defense for the truth. Nothing else saves. No goodness of man will do. Only Christ, him crucified, resurrected, glorified and coming again. And then proclaim it as you're defending it. Know it so well that as you hear the challenges and the falsehoods from within the church because they're all around us nowadays, folks, all you gotta do to slip into that is click, we say it over and over, we're gonna keep saying it. All you gotta do is go to YouTube. You will find some fool and I mean that in the biblical way, who is betraying the gospel, the truth of God, true doctrine for man-made myths and self-aggrandizing and serving teachings. And if we don't know the truth, how will we defend ourselves or anyone else? In order to uphold the truth, we must stand on it, which means we know it which means we're growing in it, which means it's continually changing and shaping us in our lives. And may we always be a place where people can come because one of you have invited them where they can hear the truth of the gospel and you should have already shared it with them before they came. This is not just the role of elders and deacons. It's what it means to live as the household. This is our purpose. We are built on truth. He is our cornerstone. Jesus in Matthew 7, 24 through 26, told a parable about a house. And the wise man built his house on a rock. And when the storms came and the, the floods grew and the wind blew, smashed against that house, it stood firm because it was built on the rock. It was built on the truth. The foolish man built his house on the sand. That's everything but the gospel. Every false teaching, every false gospel, every social truth that is no truth. And when the winds came and the floods grew and smashed against that house, it fell flat. Why do so many people in the church fall away? Why do so many people in the church uh, have great destruction in their life and witness? Why do even men who stand before people as supposed elders and leaders and teachers fail? Because they have not built on the truth. They have not built on the rock. What is this rock? It's the gospel. It is our confession. Our purpose must be built on our confession. Matthew 16, Jesus was with his disciples. It's during the last few days of his life and he calls them together and he says, hey, tell me. I don't know if Jesus, I I know Jesus was doing this for their benefit, but you you also wonder in his humanness, was he thinking, how's this this gone? I don't know. I don't want to say something I shouldn't about Jesus in that way. If it were me, let's put it that way. If it were me and I'd been spending three years, I might wonder, has anybody caught on to what I'm saying? And so he gathered them and he said, who do the crowds say that I am? There's different answers. Oh, some say Elijah, one of the prophets. Some say John the Baptist, back from the dead. Then Jesus looks at them and he says, but who do you say I am? Because that ain't it. And Peter, good old fire ready aim Peter, jumps out there. Always willing to jump out of the boat. Usually floundered afterwards, but always ready to jump out of the boat. And he says, you are the Christ, 
the Messiah, the anointed one of God. You are the son of the living God. Sound familiar, church? You are the children of the living God. You are not Jesus. He's the first among many brothers and sisters. But you're a co-heir. You're a child of God. Peter recognizes this in him, and Peter say, or Jesus says in response to Peter's confession, Peter, this has been revealed to you not by flesh or blood, but by my Father who's in heaven. Peter, you get it. God the Father has given you the, the perceptiveness, the, the ability to see with spiritual eyes and know the truth. And this truth that I am the Christ this is the foundation, me, not Peter, not any pope. Christ is the rock on which I will build my church. He gave a foundation. We are pillars standing on that foundation, upholding the truth. That is our purpose, to live as the household of the living God. Pillars and foundation supports buttresses, base standards of the truth but we must stand on the foundation of this confession. And so Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he delves into and explains, using what was probably a, a known hymn of the early church, what that truth is. Verse 16, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Mystery meaning something that's hidden, something that's secret, in the Old Testament, the Messiah was hidden. He was secret. They knew one would come, but they obviously didn't understand it because when he came to his own, they rejected him. They did not accept him. They did not see, but Peter saw. Why? Because it had now been revealed to him by the Father, the truth of godliness, that Jesus is the Christ, and he is the one who makes a way, the only way. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness now revealed. How is he revealed? He, Christ, who is revealed in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. God himself condescended to come and dwell among us as flesh and blood because only a true man could make a true fitting sacrifice for men. No other sacrifice would do. All of the rams, all of the bulls, all of the lambs, all of the doves that had been sacrificed throughout hundreds of years had to continually be sacrificed until the lamb came, until Jesus came. God himself in flesh became flesh, 100% God, 100% man. He died as a man on a cross as a once for all sacrifice to make right you before God so that a holy, just, righteous God looks on you, your sinful state of humanity and says clean, forgiven, righteous, justified. He was revealed in flesh how do we know that he was 100% God? Because he was vindicated in the Spirit. The Spirit of God himself raised the true Lamb, the righteous, sinless Son of God, God in the flesh, from the dead. Everything that Jesus had taught and proclaimed, everything he had claimed as being God, as being the, the bread from heaven, as being the Messiah, as being the one who had come, the one who would tear down the temple and see it raised in three days, the one who would, like Jonah, uh, give a sign of, of redemption, three days in the tomb, and then life. It happened, folks, and the chief priest knew it. And the Romans knew it and they tried to hide it, but it doesn't matter because it's still true today. He's alive. He was vindicated in the spirit. Everything he said about who he was was true. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and he lives today. He is the living God, our brother in the household. 
And so right here at the resurrection, we see God in Trinitarian form proclaiming who he is and who this Christ is as the Father raises the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is vindicated. He is proven to be true. He was seen by angels. Seen by angelos. A couple of ways of viewing this. I'm going to share both because they're both true. So we don't have to choose. First, one thought is seen by angels means in throughout his entire life, he was attended to and watched over by angels. When he came, incarnate as the flesh, as a baby, what happened? Angels proclaimed his arrival. Go to Bethlehem and find the babe lying in the manger. His name is Jesus. He's come to set his people free. Peace to you through him. When he is tempted by the enemy and he stands firm within that temptation, he is then attended to by angels. As he's walking through everything he did, we can only imagine how they watched on in awe. And not just the ones I'm talking about, the good ones, also the fallen ones. Those demons, those fallen angels that he exhibited power over, they knew exactly who he was. They knew he was here. They saw him working. They ran. When he said, be gone, they had to leave. They were subject to him. And finally, when he is raised to life again and Mary comes to the tomb that first Easter morning, that first resurrection day, there were a couple of angels sitting there that said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He was seen by angels throughout his ministry. There in Luke 24, 5 is where we read about the resurrection, where they proclaimed, we've seen him, he ain't here no more. He left. Where did he go after he raised? He went and showed himself to the disciples, to Mary, to others. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that he showed himself to 500 or more at one time, post-resurrection. Who are these disciples? They're angelos. They're messengers. That's what the word word means. So whether they are the created angel beings that go and proclaim the message of God that first told the good news that he is risen, he is not here, or whether it's the disciples and those who assembled on that mountaintop and saw him go back to heaven to ascend in glory, and who then later, according to Acts 1-8, went throughout all of the world carrying the message of the gospel, including Paul who came later, he has been seen by angels, by messengers who proclaimed who he is. They can prove that he's risen because they saw him with their own eyes. And then they proclaimed him among the nations. He's proclaimed among the nations, just like I referenced Acts 1-8 right there. Do you realize how amazing it is that a God who chose Israel for himself, a people, amongst all the nations of the world, has extended that same grace to us. He has called to himself a true Israel made from every tribe, tongue, nation. Us, the Gentiles, us who are far off, who have been brought near. So that those are called amongst ethnic Israel and from among all the nations of the world throughout all time will stand one day as we read there in Revelation before the throne saying salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. He was proclaimed among the nations by his messengers who had seen him risen to life, vindicated by the Spirit, God in the flesh, the Messiah. And as they proclaimed him, he was believed on in the world. People heard the good news and they believed it enough that they became messengers and they went to their deaths. They were witnesses. The word literally in Acts being the word martyr. They gave their very life's blood to stand firm and uphold the truth. So that some amongst them and around them 
would hear the good news and believe on him. John 1, 12, that we read this morning, but as many who believed on him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. He brought them into the house. And as they were brought into the house, they continued to proclaim among the nations that those who would believe would be made members of the house. And then as he stood with his disciples in Acts 1, 11, and he gave them the great commission to go proclaim the good news, to stand on the truth, to proclaim it, to defend it, to live it. He was then carried up before their very eyes. And guess who's there? Angels again. Guys, why are you standing here looking in the sky? You look a little silly. They're wondering, what's, what's happening here? We haven't seen this one before. Seen him change water to wine. He, he's alive. That's, that's pretty cool. What's he doing now? He's doing what he said. He's, he's returning to his rightful place of authority in glory. Taken up in glory to his rightful position as the man, the son of man, the one who has authority, the one who holds the keys, who will, as they told the disciples, those angels, he will come again in the same way as which you've seen him go. And so within this, Paul gives us the rock, the truth that we hold, what we find our marching orders in, what we find our identity in, how we are to live, how we are to breathe, how we are to bring glory and honor to the name of Christ, to God our Father, to live as the household is to stand firm on the gospel truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, crucified, buried, but risen again and reigning forever and ever as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will change and bring to life the dead who are his. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Be the household. Stand on the truth. Live by the truth. Live empowered by the Spirit of God in you, bringing to life this gospel truth. Guarding the gospel means upholding the truth, that Jesus is the resurrected and reigning Christ. And we do that through our words and through our conduct by confessing him as Lord, not Caesar, not that dead man God, or any of the rest of them. Not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Joseph Smith, not any number of popes. Jesus. Confess him as Lord with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And as you live changed and conforming and being conformed to his likeness and this, the fruit of the Spirit is being produced in you, you'll bring honor to the the household, to the master. So proclaim this truth boldly, humbly, because he didn't do it because you deserved it. He didn't save you because you were good. He saved you because you had no other hope and because he determined to call you out of darkness, from death to life, for his glory. First Baptist Church, may we be a part of the household where we mean what we say, that we exist to glorify Christ in worship, both as assembled church and as living in the world church through worship, through discipleship as we join together and tell each other again the gospel over and over until it produces in us the fruit of righteousness and conforms us more and more to his image until we see him one day glorified. And in mission, as we go and proclaim this truth boldly, humbly, graciously, but with tenacity and stick to May we hold to the gospel like a pit bull on a bone and never let it go. It is our hope. It is our strength. It is our joy, it is our glory, it is our charge, it is our privilege 
And may it be our life. Father, this morning we pray that you would make this true in us more and more each day. That, Lord, we would stand before you with holy hands and hearts. That we would adorn ourselves with the godliness that comes through you. That by believing on your name, by confessing with our mouth that you are Lord and confessing and believing in our heart that, that you have been raised from the dead, we might be saved and so might others around us. Lord, may we conduct ourselves in the household in a way that's fitting and proper as children of the living God. May we uphold your truth firmly as we stand on the foundation, the only rock that saves us from the storms and trials, blowing winds of change in the world. Lord, maybe you be glorified through us. We pray this together. And all the church said, amen.